Rahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Good afternoon Malaysia and ASEAN neighbors. Good morning United Kingdom. Good day Australia. Welcome to all participants and viewers of this webinar entitled Envisioning Architecture Education for Malaysia. A big topic and I'm not surprised if it is also a hot topic, especially to the academics and professional in the fraternity. Make sure you register your attendance so that you will receive an e-certificate from the Secretariat via email after the webinar. Before we begin, I would like to invite Brother Dr. Ayman Muhammad Rashid to lead the Doa recitation. To our non-Muslim friends and viewers, you are invited to observe a moment of silence, contemplation and prayer in your own customary. Over to you, Brother Dr. Ayman. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillahi Wa Fina Aman Wa Ika Fi Mazidah Ya Rabbana Laka Alhamdu Kama Yang Baghi Li Jalal Li Wajhika Al Qalibi Wa Azim Sultanik Allahumma Salli Wa Sallim Ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in Allahumma Inna Nas'aluka Khairan Hatha Al Yawm Al Fatha Wa Nasrahu Wa Nurahu Wa Baraktahu Wa Huda All praise is due to the Almighty God Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the world May the peace and mercy of Allah be upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family, companions, and followers. Verily, we have assembled this day to express our gratitude for your perennial blessings, O Allah. Make us your servants who are always grateful for the blessings that we have bestowed upon us. On this blessed afternoon, we gathered in conjunction with the Envisioning Architecture Education in Malaysia International Webinar. O Allah, we beg you to open the doors of your mercy and unfold for us the, the treasure of knowledge that we are seeking for us to develop our potential as your servant whom you are pleased with by your mercy, O Allah, the most merciful of the merciful ones. O Allah, we, we beg of you to bless our assembly. We beg of you to bring us to the darkness of doubt and favor us with the light of compassion, for you are omnipotent and benevolent. O oh Allah, kindly give us your strength and courage to face the struggle to find and gain knowledge. Kindly bestow upon us your blessings and grant us your great physic, mind, and spirit to keep on worshipping you, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, we beg you to grant us the strength for us to serve our people, society, nation, and religion. Rabbana taqabbalna innaka anta sami'ul alim. Rabbana tumalayna innaka anta tawwabur rahim. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والحمد لله رب العالمين. Thank you, Brother Dr. Ayman, Honorable Guests, Esteemed Panelists, Ladies and Gentlemen, Respected Viewers and Participants. I am Syed Iskandar Arifin, Moderator of this webinar. Are you ready? I'm sure you are. So let us now begin. I have dwelled briefly on historical development of architecture education during the first webinar. We now know that much of what we have in architecture education today are largely influenced by the Bauhaus system of pedagogy and the momentous decision on curricula made during the first Oxford conference. In Malaysia, a formal architecture education was first introduced by the British administration through the setting up of the Technical College in Kuala Lumpur. From early 1970s to late 1990s, three universities, namely UTM, UITM, and USM, have been shouldering the responsibility to produce architectural graduates who then become the architects for this country. As of now, we have 10 universities offering program of architecture at Bachelor of Science and Master degree level, equivalent with LAM Part 1 and LAM Part 2 qualifying professional examinations. We also have another universities offering Bachelor of Science degree equivalent to LAM Part 1. In total, we have 18 
architectural education providers. Starting third quarter last year, Ministry of Higher Education, Malaysia, has been very kind in granting us a special research grant to COHAS, Council of Heads of Architecture School, to conduct a research to produce a strategic document that will chart architecture education for this nation for another 10 years until 2030. Referred here as Hala Tuju Pendidikan Seni Negara 2020. In short, we shall refer this document as HPSN 2030. This HPSN 2030 shall replace the previous document published in 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, respected viewers and participants, the HPSN 2030 is the reason for us to be in this webinar. It is the future that we are about to discuss the future of architecture education in this country. In doing so, we cannot ignore the development of architecture education happening elsewhere in the world. Unlike the first one, this webinar is different for two reasons. First, we have with us experts in architectural education who are well exposed to international as well as the British context. Second, we have a towering personality in higher education, governance and leadership, who is a non-architect. I'm sure it's going to be interesting to listen to what they have to say about architectural education. The views and points that we are likely to gather from our panelists, persons of prominent figure in the academia, as well as from the viewers through the question and answer session, shall be noted by the research team. To grace the opening of this webinar, I'm pleased to invite architect Mustafa Muhammad Saleh, the Chairman of Council of Architectural Accreditation and Education Malaysia, Board of Architect Malaysia, simply known by its Malay acronym MAMS, to deliver his welcoming speech. Over to you, Mr. Chairman, architect Mustafa. Thank you very much, uh, moderator Dr. Said. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon to everyone in Malaysia. While not to forget our friends, uh, our speakers in the UK as well. Uh, it was seem to be uh, about six o'clock now. Uh, I'm glad to welcome uh, the Honorable President Board of Architect Malaysia, Architect Zairo Azidin Badri, our distinguished expert panel speakers. Emeritus Professor Tansri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Director, Rector of International Islamic University Malaysia, IIUM, who is also a member of Board of Directors Malaysia Productivity Corporation, MDC. And a very warm welcome also to Professor Dr. Ashraf Salama, who is a Director of Research Cluster of Architecture and Urbanism in the Global South. University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, United Kingdom. And also uh, welcome Professor Dr. Chris Tweed, Head of School of Chair in Sustainable Design, Cardiff University, UK, whom both of you I have met sometime before this. Uh, uh, welcome, please, again. And not to forget our moderator, Professor Dr. Syed Ahmad Iskandar, who is the member of CAAEM, a very senior member of CAAEM, and now Executive Director, Institute Sultan Iskandar, ISI, UTM. The organizer of the webinar HPSN 2030, architect Dr. Srazali, Dr. Arifin, uh, Ben Arifin, Chairman of COHAS, which is Council of Head of Architecture School and its committee members. And not to forget Associate Professor Dr. Ali Sabrina Ismail, who is the lead researcher, Halatuju Pendidikan Seni Bena Negara, which is known as HPSN 2030. Last but not least, the distinguished participant of the architectural fraternity who are here today, academic members of institution and practicing architect who are with us in this webinar, and welcome to you all. Assalamualaikum 
Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and good afternoon and of, as well as morning. Good morning. First of all, let us express our gratitude to our Creator, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because with His bounty and permission, we can virtually gather today in the webinar series number two with the theme of envisioning the architecture education in 2030. I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to the Board of Architect Malaysia, who is partner to this, this event with uh, Education Ministry, the Council of Architecture Education Education Malaysia, CAEM, Council of Head of Architecture School, COHAS, and University Technology Malaysia, UTM, in collaboration with Ministry of Higher Education for organizing this national webinar today. This webinar is part of the effort and process of the ongoing research based grant entrusted to COHAS by the Ministry to produce a document that will provide a direction for architecture education in the next 10 years. It is, for now, called Halatuju Pendidikan Senibena Negara, HPSN 2030. The outcome of HPSN 2030 is very significant to bring about the quality of standards of architectural education in Malaysia, focusing on the four main thrusts. Number one, flexible and nurtured curriculum. Number two, highly qualified academics. Number three, quality students and graduate. And last but not least, to redefine infrastructure for architectural studies, i.e. improving the studio-based learning to meet the challenge, the challenges and the crisis in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the architectural fraternity, as we are now experiencing the pandemic of COVID-19, which has affected many spectrum of life, architecture education is no exception. On this note, CAAEM responded to the restriction and limitation due to movement control order, what we call here in Malaysia MCO, and has issued four special notes to provide guidance and basic requirement in the teaching and learning of architectural studio to the universities. These notes provide clear indication of what are the expectations of CAAM without compromising the quality and standards of architectural graduates when we visit um, them for accreditation at the institution provider. CAEM and LAM is very proud and grateful that this webinar series number two is able to be carried out online with the commitment and contribution shown by the team, members of COHAS, led by Chairman Architect Dr. Srazali. And I must thank and congratulate the UTM lead researcher of HPSM 2030 Associate Professor Dr. Ali Sabrina, with her technical team in UTM Joe Baru, hosting the successful previous webinar series number one, and today our webinar series number two. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the architectural property uh, fraternity, sorry. as chairman of CAEM, I would like to take this opportunity today to announce that this year. In 2021, Max and LAM have decided to proceed with the International Architectural Education Exhibition and Conference, IAEEC 2021. Uh, if Dr. Sai have got some slide, a teaser to show it while I'm talking, uh, which has to be postponed last year uh, and now to be reactivated and scheduled to be carried out on a date of 26 to 27 October 2021. Hopefully our COVID situation at that time, whatever situation is, we still will go on on this 26 to 27 October. So please put that in your diary so that everybody can participate in our inaugural uh, conference that we are holding. The aim of IAEC 2021 is mainly to showcase the standard and quality of students' work 
and perhaps the student from abroad where schools have been validated as well. This international architectural education and exhibition IAEC 2021 is led by Associate Professor uh, Mio Muhammad Farid of UPM, who is also a senior member of CAEM. Uh, architect Professor Mio had established several key portfolios comprises of academicians and practitioners to ensure the smooth running of the event, inshallah. We seek participation and contribution from the accredited schools of public and private institution to be part of this inaugural event. We are inviting uh, overseas from UK, Australia, as well as the ASEAN countries to participate in this event. On behalf of MAPS, LAM, I would like to express appreciation to three distinguished panel who are with here today, Emeritus Professor Tan Sri and Professor Ashraf Salama and Professor Chris Tweet for willingly to share your thoughts and wisdom on certain areas of your expertise. Your views will surely be captured in establishing the direction of our architecture education in Malaysia. Our deepest appreciation also goes to moderator, Professor Dr. Syed Iskandar for kindly moderating this ambition. Last but not least, terima kasih and thank you to all participants to this webinar. I hope you can actively participate in the Q&A session later. If your attendance and participation is recorded and registered, LAM will be issuing a CPT point appropriate to the event. With that, I end my welcome address with the Lafaz Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, marking the webinar series number two is official and wish all of you have a meaningful webinar. I thank you. Wabillahi taufiq. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Mustafa bin Muhammad Saleh, Chairman of MAPS Malaysia, for the opening remarks. We, this webinar is followed by almost 200 participants at the moment. I know that many more will be joining us slightly later. Uh, so let me now proceed to the next itinerary, which is the presentation by the expert panel. Let me first introduce the first panel, Professor Dr. Ashraf Salama. I will cite some of the significant achievements and contribution of Professor Dr. Ashraf Salama. And meanwhile, viewers may read his brief resume on the screen. Professor, Professor Ashraf is the head of Department of Architecture, University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, Scotland. He is well known internationally and recognized through an extensive record of research work, publication, and strong citation report. He was awarded in, in 2017 at UIA Jean Shumi Prize for excellence in architectural education and criticism. A long list of awards and recognition. I'm sure you have read it briefly uh, on the screen. Uh, to without delaying any more time, I will I would like to call Professor Ashraf Salama to deliver his presentation titled "Global Views on Architecture Education." I'm I'm sure Professor Ashraf Salama is now ready. He's already on the screen. Yes. You may start at any time, Prof, uh, when you feel ready. Okay, I am ready. Uh, uh, Salam alaikum and good morning and good afternoon, uh, respected colleagues and audience. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this webinar, really, on uh, envisioning architectural education for Malaysia. Uh, and I would like to thank um, um, colleagues, uh, LAM, the council, uh, and uh, all colleagues um, who are part and organizing and leading this uh, seminar. 
Uh, I would also uh, like to say that uh, it's a great honor to be a part of uh, um, a team of uh, distinguished speakers, um, Professor Abdrazak and um, uh, Professor uh, Chris Tweed. The presentation is trying to capture a discourse on global views, which uh, requires a narrative. Uh, we, we need to put it in a narrative. And that narrative, uh, part of it is historical and part of it is contemporary. Um, but in general sense, um, the presentation is trying to really cover a number of issues and it's all about models, inherited models, um, the criticism against these models and then emerging models and how these emerging models paved the way for architecture education uh, to develop alternatives. Um, next, please. In trying to relate to the current uh, uh, higher education system, and also I like to establish my position here, I would like to refer to Sir Ken Robinson, uh, who presented a critique of the overall system of education. Uh, arguing that every country in the world at the moment is trying to reform education. And that's for two reasons, one economic and one cultural. Uh, the economic reason is trying to work, uh, how do we educate our future generations to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? Uh, and the cultural reason is trying to figure out how do we educate our future generations so that they have a sense of cultural identity. So far, there is no problem, but uh, what is the problem here? The problem is simply is that we are trying to meet the future by what we have done in the past. That's an important thing. Uh, the problem is that the current system of education was designed and developed and conceived and structured for a different age. Uh, and it was conceived in the intellectual culture of the enlightenment, 17th and 18th century, and even before, uh, which basically two centuries ago or more, and in the economic circumstances of the industrial revolution. Now we have a different economy and we have a different culture. Uh, so what do we do with the education system? Next, please. And looking at this critique as it relates to architecture education, one can identify a number of models and uh, two models, basically. Uh, vocational, which promotes professionalism in the sense of relating to uh, architecture only as a profession, or intellectual, which promotes learning and unlearning and relearning and enlightenment. And we tend to look at these either or. Uh, and in, in reality, they shouldn't be either or. It's, they should be both. Um, within that, again, there are two types of uh, uh, pedagogies. One is mechanistic pedagogy, which supports the, the interest of the higher education system. Uh, and systemic pedagogy, which supports the learning process itself. Uh, and these are some of the characteristics that you can see in the screen and without going through them. Uh, and basically the, the, uh, the uh, um, mechanistic pedagogy uh, fragment the educational process to a level that doesn't support learning. Uh, it relies on showing and telling modes of communication rather than exploration of uh, 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 the self and how people and, and students actu actualize their, their potential and meet their potential. So it's not either or, it's both. Next, please. And if architecture, next, please. Yes, if architecture is about buildings only, why do we have it in the university system? That's the, the, the point. So architecture is a discipline and a profession. It's both. And the complexity of modern times mandates seeing architecture 
as a profession, the art and science of buildings, but also as a discipline, which integrates different types of knowledge. And as we can see here in this diagram, trying to look at the domains of knowledge that support architecture and architectural design and natural sciences and engineering, humanities, social sciences and arts. And all of them are critical to the development of a successful uh, profession. Next, please. Having a closer look and without going into the history of these models, and I call them inherited models, uh, uh, throughout the history, these are the, the traditional models which are inherited from the past, adopted and then adapted in different contexts, whether in, in, in North America or Europe, but the, the Beaux-Arts model or the, uh, the uh, fine arts model, the French model, uh, which continued for probably 250 years and followed by the Bauhaus and Vic Houtemus, which is another school that was developed in parallel to the Bauhaus, less known, but had an impact on Eastern Europe and some Balkan countries. Uh, uh, the three schools basically were dominant schools uh, as, as holistically the three impacted architectural education everywhere in the world. The problem with these inherited models, next please, is that they focus on a number of characteristics, although their uh, ideologies were different, they focus on similar characteristics. The idea of the talented and gifted architect is there in the three models. Uh, they see the process of education as a form of experience transfer, trying to simulate that notion of the uh, master builder. Uh, and they see the architect as the individual maker of buildings relying on the creative impulses only. The various versions of architectural education uh, uh, adopting these models were heavily criticized in the contemporary literature from the 60s till today. Um, but overall, while they were uh, education models or systems, they influenced the entire system of architectural education everywhere in the world, everywhere, really everywhere. Now, next please. In examining the criticism developed against these uh, uh, inherited models, um, one would review the entire body of knowledge developed from the mid 50s to probably late 90s and how that literature was centered on criticizing the inherited models, uh, arguing that in terms of content, in terms of process, in terms of teaching style, they are not equipped to meet the realities of our times. Next, please. But still, that criticism needed some form of uh, verification through, through a number of surveys of contemporary design educators. Uh, uh, these surveys I have personally conducted in the 90s and 2000s, and also additional surveys were uh, conducted recently, all of them focus on critical issues and support the criticism that was generated from uh, uh, the, the, the body of knowledge on these models. Uh, for example, some of the statements and the criticism of these models, failure to grip the fundamental problems of building technology, uh, separation between knowledge acquisition and knowledge application. Uh, in terms of process, uh, uh, focusing on uh, that notion of generating solutions without sufficient opportunities to explore the nature of design and uh, explore the nature of design problems, which is basically a research process that should be integrated in the study. Uh, so the criticism was really uh, uh, intensive by even some of the contemporary design educators. Looking next, please. This becomes evident when we look at recent surveys that examine how the public perceive the profession of architecture. That's an important point that we really need to look at. Um, so the public 
basically doesn't understand what architects do. That's a critical point that we really need to look at. Should we blame the public or blame professional organizations or blame architecture education? So what is the reason behind not knowing what architects do? And imagine in certain contexts, developed contexts, when the public doesn't understand what architects do. So you can imagine what's happening in other contexts around the world. Next, please. To try to understand, next, please, uh, how these models have slightly evolved throughout the uh, history, especially in the last 30, 40 years, we can look at different paradigm shifts in terms of uh, uh, how we understand the built environment and how we conceive it uh, uh, in terms of environmental consciousness, in terms of sustainability, in terms of housing production. Uh, all these elements were part of two important paradigm shifts, uh, trying to look at relationships between things that impact the production of architecture and trying to move beyond techno development uh, and move to eco-development. Of course, these terms have evolved throughout the years until today. Now we talk about sustainable development goals. We talk about other parameters. Next, please. So in response to the criticism and in response to uh, these paradigm shifts, many committed educators have tried to develop alternatives to studio practices and to studio pedagogy throughout the years. And some of the models were identified and reviewed, and these were basically trying to strike a balance between the content, process, and teaching style, trying to commit themselves to shaping the studio objectives and outcomes, trying to uh, see the design studio as a site for critical inquiry. Next, please. Trying to look at the design process as a systematic process that must adopt logical procedures. It's not just about developing design solutions. And some of these qualities of these models, introduction of evidence-based uh, design, integration of research into the design process, commitment to shape studio uh, objectives and articulate outcomes. Next, please. Variations of these revolutionary models. And the reason really I'm calling them revolutionary models because their authors and the educators behind them managed to break the system, managed uh, 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 to have the courage to go beyond the mainstream culture of architecture education, which relies heavily on these inherited, on the previous inherited models. So these variations uh, resulted in a number of approaches that we witness today and these approaches are basically design build um, um, or life studios or uh, uh, learning by doing and learning by making. And, and this can take place at different stages of the student life within the school, whether in beginning classes or in intermediate classes or in final years. Uh, working with communities, solving uh, uh, community social issues and uh, uh, community problems. Next, please. The introduction of VR, hybrid technologies to integrate VR with traditional modes of engagements, uh, with virtual exhibitions and hybrid uh, forms of jury practices. Next, please. The introduction of process-based learning and considering research as an integral component of the design process in the studio. Uh, also integrated design to go to a reasonable level of details, not just about generating concepts, but reasonable level of details uh, or detailing design ideas to include construction and environmental technologies and how these manifest in developing a design solution. Next, please. Uh, ideas related to uh, uh, collaborative learning, design games, uh, giving students opportunities to have control over their learning. That's an important aspect, trying to uh, develop uh, structured decisions and uh, 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 collaborative 
decision making processes uh, in the studio collectively, because this is a simulation of what happens in reality. Also is one of the approaches. Next, please. Looking at active learning models, uh, uh, which is one of the variations that came out of the revolutionary models. Uh, basically, the notion of active learning in the classroom setting or in the studio. Uh, uh, one of the important things is that also we give the entire focus on studio pedagogy, which is 50% in most cases of the curriculum. But what about the other 50%? The other 50% is really important also to think of and develop responsive uh, pedagogies that enable the integration of knowledge and research into design uh, activities. And here uh, in, in active learning, basically it's based on the assumption that the attention span of the average adult declines dramatically after eight minutes. So imagine if we are giving a lecture that is sometimes uh, uh, reach uh, uh, two hours and one hour and a half or all of that. So the attention span of the students, so developing active learning exercises and giving opportunities to students to really uh, uh, relate to the material submitted or presented in the, in the classroom is uh, uh, one of the approaches. Next, please. I was trying to address some of these and some of the publications and the latest publications involved uh, uh, the development of a book on spatial design pedagogy and also developing uh, uh, two special issues on uh, shaping architectural education in Scotland and also another special issue of the Association of Architectural Educators on uh, architectural education in the Global South. Next, please. But a key point to address is the multiplicity of challenges and issues architectural education has to encounter and prepare future architects for. And this is evident in the amount of problems and challenges we see today. Transformations in the structure of contemporary societies, the rising need of children, special population, women, and those with special needs, the continuous crisis of housing and squatter settlements, uh, the emergence of new building typologies that accommodate new types of clients and new types of users. Uh, the, the development or the surge in the construction and the need for sustainable environments, the global condition and the loss of cultural identity, displacement of communities as a result of migration patterns or of natural disasters or of civic conflict. Dealing with these challenges require a different type of architect that who is very different from what was developed through the uh, Beaux-Arts and Bauhaus. Uh, the notion of decolonizing architectural pedagogy, and that's an important one. Two, trying to look at local knowledge. It's not only about the universal standards of knowledge in architecture. Uh, so decolonizing the curriculum, looking for local knowledge, indiz indigenous knowledge is really critical for the future. Next, please. These challenges um, basically tell us what? Tell us that demands for multiple types of knowledge are clearly on the rise. And this is a list of knowledge types that we, uh, we need to educate our future generations and equip them with knowledge in these areas. And this is not exclusive. Knowledge will continue to evolve also because based on the emerging challenges and the contextual aspects of each challenge, we can develop a new type of knowledge. So that's a critical one too, to address what kind of knowledge we need to introduce to uh, uh, our students and also enable them to generate knowledge themselves. Next, please. Which leads to two important things. Uh, the multiplicity of problems and the multiplicity of knowledge types represent a hybrid condition. And a hybrid condition requires hybrid modes of thinking and hybrid mechanisms of investigation, which leads us to talk about transdisciplinarity. Multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity has not 
enabled solving uh, uh, environmental or social problems and challenges. And now we are calling for transdisciplinarity, how to develop a design studio that engages civil engineers, sociologists, and architects to work together to solve an environmental problem or a social problem. How do we do that? That's the future. It's not, architects cannot do it alone anymore. Uh, next, please. So we need different types of architects. Uh, if we look at this list, egoist, pragmatist, facilitator, technical assistant giver, and advocate, the current system of education in most cases, in most cases, without generalizing too much, places emphasis on one of the two, uh, or one or the two, egoist and pragmatist. Basically, develop an architect with an attitude who says, I give the people what I want, and then, or I give the people what they want. So one of these, uh, either I want this or the client want that, that's it. There are other models and there are other rules that architects can do and should do in response to this multiplicity of problems. Next, please. Uh, a very recent activity I was engaged in, the UIA Awards for Innovation Architecture Education. I was honored to be uh, the curator of the award. Um, uh, architect Mustafa Saleh was one of our uh, esteemed jury members. And the jury members represented 10 countries. So uh, imagine a jury uh, from different cultural backgrounds, different interests, representing and giving views about schemes uh, uh, developed by schools of architecture worldwide. Uh, the award is not given to an individual. It's given to a school or a team who is teaching. So it can be offered to a student and staff working together or to the entire school based on their production and what they submitted. Uh, and there were two criteria. One, demonstrating excellence in pedagogical practices and two, demonstrating excellence in shaping a sustainable future by addressing uh, uh, sustainable United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, as the results are not announced yet, I will present some uh, uh, schemes, but without mentioning names at this stage. This is one of the awarded, next please, of the awarded schemes, which is basically trying to look at on-site collaboration, architecture, uh, and try to solve problems in extreme environments. Um, and the project, or the work is developed in collaboration with communities who are situated in really extreme environments. Uh, and all the 17 sustainable development goals are covered. Of course, I'm showing one slide, but the project has other dimensions that are, that are not in this presentation. But this is one of the awarded schemes. So the idea of working with communities, addressing sustainable development goals are critical. And at the same time, community development participation become uh, uh, important parameters. Next, please. Um, this is another one. And not using the studio as a platform for generating ideas, but using a seminar class and the use of that seminar class to investigate traditional building methods, many of which have been lost in the body of knowledge, in the current body of knowledge. Again, in a class, trying to engage with realities and trying to uh, develop participatory mechanisms to uh, generate knowledge about, or lost knowledge about traditional building techniques and materials. And this is part of decolonizing architectural education. Next, please. Um, living construction in rural communities. And this is also as an idea, engaging with rural communities. We, we have a tendency to keep working in cities and focus on cities. So the innovation in weaving architectural, cultural, social, environmental challenges together in a rural community uh, uh, is an important aspect of this uh, work basically trying to, to balance these dimensions and develop trade-off scenarios uh, in, in generating solutions. Next, please. 
sustainable design studios and basically collaboration between architects, academics, students, local communities, and professionals working in other fields. That's also another uh, 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 awarded scheme. Trying to look for learning opportunities, learning opportunities that integrate fragmented pieces of knowledge into developing uh, uh, a solution to a specific problem in a specific site uh, and departing from the notion of hypothetical design assignments and hypothetical design projects. Next, please. Now, recently, we have been trying to explore that idea of COVID and the impact and implications of COVID on architectural education and whether this is temporary or is going to continue forever or what. Uh, and basically, it appears that we are currently adopting an operational mode. We are reacting to, to, to sudden change that took place last March, but we, we, we have not had a chance yet to explore and aspire to how architectural education will look like. And this event is really important in this aspect, in the sense of trying to look beyond what's happening today and the challenges we are meeting today. Next, please. I want to refer to one important uh, element, that idea of reacting to change versus creating the one before, please. Uh, creating adaptive systems, uh, the idea of the loss of the stable state. The loss of the stable state means that we are not going to have a new normal. Everybody keeps talking about the new normal. There will be no new normal. And actually, the current virus variants tell us that there will be no stable condition coming. Everything is going to be evolving all the time. So. That idea of the loss of the stable state, which was generated by Donald Schoen in the 70s in the field of management and how this uh, 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 can be utilized in our understanding of future education systems, creating adaptive systems in architectural education, flexible systems that can accommodate changes, emerging situations, contingent challenges and all of these. Next, please. I will end with, 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 I have two slides remaining, this one and, and, and the next one. I want to say that the condition we are in now eliminated a model that continued for more than 200 years, but is not leading to a new stable normal. It is leading to a fluctuating unstable state or unstable condition that requires that adaptive system. Okay. Within this paradigm, there is a number of opportunities. There are many opportunities, and this condition really is creating an, uh, uh, an aspiration for us to look into a number of possibilities, whether decolonization, redefining that idea of learning from the environment. If students cannot go to sites and cannot visit buildings, how can we abstract the essential characteristics of buildings and environments and bring them to the online platform. So a redefinition of learning from the environment, a redefinition of the uh, uh, um, um, visiting buildings and learning from realities, a redefinition of the, that idea of protocols and standards and how we engage with the students, which we call the hidden curriculum. Uh, the move from uh, larger scale buildings to retrofitting and smaller scale buildings, the idea of transdisciplinarity and working with groups from other disciplines. All of these are important opportunities that the COVID-19 condition is putting forward for us. Next, please. I will conclude here uh, uh, with this statement. I'm not going to read it, but basically we cannot face the future with what we have inherited from the past or with a university system which was developed in the context of the 18th century uh, uh, during the European Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. We need adaptive systems that enable flexibility, that enable meeting requirements that we don't know in the future. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, Prof. Ashraf Salama. It was Thank indeed uh, an insightful, forward-looking, and thought-provoking presentation. I truly feel a privilege to be able to listen to your presentation. Uh, I hope we could spend a lot more time on this matter. It's spot on with the theme of the webinar. Uh, I will leave you at that and give you a time for rest for a moment. We shall be back at the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Prof. Ashraf Salama. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have question to ask your viewers and participants, you may do so by writing it in the comment section at FD Live or in chat chat segment in Webex. The Secretariat will administer your questions and we will deliver them to our panelists during the question and answer session on the, of this web, webinar. In the interest of time, I shall now introduce you straight away to the second panelist. Yang berbahagia Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak the Rector of International Islamic University, Malaysia, who is also a member of the Board of Directors, Malaysia Productivity Corporation. As I did earlier, I will also cite selected and significant achievements and contributions of Tan Sri Zulkifli. Viewers may read his brief resume on the screen. Tan Sri Dato Zulkifli has been appointed as the Vice Chancellor of University of Science Malaysia since 2000 to 2011. He has received many honorary doctorate of science from other higher learning institutions such as University of Portsmouth, University of Nottingham and Istanbul Commerce University. He was also the recipient of Anugrah Buku Negara 2016. I know that the list will go on and on. The brief shown on the screen is sufficient for this purpose of the webinar. And a person who has Tan Sri is a person who has spent almost the entire of his career in the academia, serving the university at various capacity on leadership and governance. Tan Sri Zulkifli is going to share with us his thought entitled The Leadership in the Built Environment, Sustainability and Resiliency. It is truly a privilege to have him in this webinar. I'm sure Tan Sri is now ready on the other side. How are you, Tansi? I'm ready. Can I share my screen now? Yes, please do so. You uh, may start at any time, Tansi, when you feel ready. Okay, okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Uh, salam sejahtera and a greeting of peace. Uh, I would like to thank her, first of all, for the invitation. I feel a little bit humbled, uh, not being an architect, uh, neither do I have any inclination of what the, the discussion is all about. But nevertheless, uh, I was uh, trying to be an architect when I was in the uh, secondary school, but somehow or other got pushed into science and the archite architecture thing be becomes a dream. So I really enjoy uh, listening to the speaker just now and try to pretend that I understand what you're, what you're talking about. So I've, I've been given this topic, leadership in built environment, sustainability and resiliency. So I would like to uh, say my piece. I uh, hope it is relevant uh, to what you say. In, in the context of you are trying to move into the year 2030, and 2030 is a very significant year as far as UNESCO is concerned when we look at education 2030 that is at the end of the Sustainable Development Goal uh, beginning, what, 2015. So yes. it is a significant deadline, a significant point uh, as to where we have arrived as far as, as far as education is concerned. Now, let me, let me just go into, into, I hope you have seen my screen. 
Um, can you put it on uh, slideshow mode? Uh, I think the slideshow mode did it not. Okay, am I right now? Okay, so no. I want to go back to almost 30 years ago when we first talked about the context of development, Rio Earth Summit 1992 in Rio. And as you can see there, those are the gentlemen uh, with, uh, uh, with expertise to talk about what environment and development is all about. I guess my, my awareness of what this is all about begin then when I was still uh, in, in the university in USM at that particular time. And you can see most of them are elderly, uh, half of them or most of them are, are male and white. Uh, but suddenly in that particular speech, uh, we talk about how do we work together uh, saving the earth. I think this, this is a very important uh, tagline that we need to work together to save the earth. As much as Professor Ashraf, uh, we shared a kind of uh, common uh, values. I was also from Strike Flight. Uh, how do we work together to save the earth? So the whole idea of trans transdisciplinary working together collaboratively is already the idea of what we have uh, talked about in this particular context. Now, what's wrong? No, share screen. But in that particular in that particular conference, uh, we somehow or rather got to listen to a 12-year-old girl, uh, Seven Suzuki, which is the daughter of David Suzuki, an environmentalist. And he challenges uh, the whole uh, conference by saying that, you know, uh, if all the money we spend on war was spent on ending poverty and finding environmental answers, what a wonderful place this earth would be. And I think this statement still holds today. So much of money gone to war, so much of money gone to something which is actually uh, useless in the context of poverty, and we are now suffering the consequence of this. And she also made another statement, which I think is profound today. He said, I'm afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. We are in the same in the same boat today, and that's the air that we are breathing. But we have now got another uh, 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 what they call a particular concern, which is the COVID nineteen. And hence, I think if she was to talk about it now, she will have to wear this this face mask, right? Um, this is the context that I'm coming from. This is thirty years ago, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's not something which is new, and I think we should be aware of what has been going on for the last three decades, all right? And we come then a year 20 years later when we revisited uh, uh, when we revisited uh, uh, the Earth Summit and we've got a document building our common future. Again, this work collaboratively, transdisciplinarily, as, as we've talked about. And yet uh, then uh, we have got this whole idea of sustainable development, working not only on the environment, but also the economic and the community part of it so that we can get this concept of sustainability, a shared values between three uh, three dimension rather than rather than just one. Uh, but the reality check at that particular point, 2012, which is 20 years, uh, we see this statements like leaders are inundated with increasing perception of incompetence, greed, and frivolity at the expense of the govern, the tax, and the manage. In our university, perhaps at the expense of the students, uh, the staff, and also the community. In other, in other words, there was no leadership. Although we talked about this, there was no leadership then, and I think there's also no leadership now in trying to bring this common future that we talk about architecturally or, or, or otherwise. All right? We have got now what we call a Mickey Mouse uh, sort of development structure. We work only on the economics, whereas the, the two years of uh, ecology and, uh, um, and, and uh, society uh, is not very much worked upon. Everything is economic centric. Everything is development in the context of unsustainability. And therefore, this Mickey Mouse model is what education has been built on uh, as far as, as, as far as I can see. And therefore, we need to change this. And the person to change is another lady. This time, 16 years old, Greta Thunberg. I think you know her. Uh, two years after, after the, uh, what do you call, uh, the, the Rio summit, uh, every Friday, she stood in front of the a Swedish uh, parliament and refused to go to school and make the statements, if education is going to be not going to be relevant to my future, then I refuse to go to class. 
and she started a movement, Fridays for the Future, that takes millions of people around the world and demonstrating to say what is it that they want as far as uh, the, the, the youth the youth is concerned. Okay. Huh? Are you are you seeing my screen to Apone side? Yeah. It's not moving, Tansi, and also it's not on display mode. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. We are we are trying to we are trying to readdress this. Is what okay. is it okay now? No, it's not appearing. It's appearing as a not as slideshow. Ah, God, I'm sorry. At least you can continue talking, uh, presenting, and see while your technician. Yeah. So, uh, Greta Thunberg has got another another uh, another concern, and her concern is about uh, uh, climate change, uh, global warming. And this is a 16 years old girl who are now begging for uh, her future to be looked into. And there are statements from her a discussion that challenges older people like us and say, how dare you basically not attending to what she is trying uh, to, to, what do you call it, to call on as far as their future is concerned. So I want to give you this background. In other words, uh, what you are talking today is not relative, it's not new. Uh, relatively speaking, because the younger generation has already got into this and they feel the education that we're giving them are actually not relevant at all to what they are facing today. So your idea of trying to look at curriculums, architecture or otherwise, including this university, is something that I think we should kind of uh, uh, celebrate so that this can be more relevant to them. Now, in that context, I think we need to come into, into terms of what uh, we need to do uh, in, in the future. You need to go back to my slides. I have lost it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I am sorry about this technical technical difficulty. Hang those. It hangs through. I, I am sorry about this. Anyway. Uh, what we what we are trying to do now is basically to try to interpret education in the context of sustainable development. Uh, I think in the year in the year 2005, already UNESCO brought, bring about what we call education for sustainable development, and I'm not too sure how many universities. We lost you, Tansri. Your screen, please. But I can move. Uh, there's. Uh, it seems that there is a technical difficulties glitches at the. At the sites of the Tansi Zoo at International Islamic University of Asia. Uh, may I suggest this? Uh, is Tansi uh, can Tansi listen to me? Okay. Vision? But air condition within the context of COVID is not a good thing because you can pass the bug through your uh, air conduct and it's not something which is desirable. We need windows now in, 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 our, in, our, in our context of trying to beat uh, the, the COVID uh, en environment. Are you able to see it now, uh, Apani? No. Prof Said, can, are you able to see the slides now? I think it's Simpson, 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 time to panic. Okay, so yeah. then, okay, let, let me go back, let me go back very quickly to this girl. This girl say, I don't want you, I don't want your hope, I don't want you to be hopeful, I want you to panic and act as if this house is on fire. I think this is what we need to do now, we need to, to embark this panicky thing 
After all, she is the person of the year uh, in 2019. And I think we need to go into this panic sort, sort of mode. What is the panic mode? The panic mode is about global warming, climate change. And I think if you ask our student today, what is global warming and climate change? I think half of them probably have no idea of what's happening. We can make, a, we can make a, a, an analogy. Uh, for COVID, we need to face masks. For this one, maybe we need to use uh, a, a kind of uh, another mask for the eye, a spectacle of some sort. Yeah, We need to cover our head because it's so warm. All right. And very soon, we're going to wear oxygen masks to get a kind of uh, you know, fresh air within us. This is a panicky state that I think we need to create so that people who make uh, policies, uh, who runs education will understand the kind of uh, desperate uh, situation we are in as far as, as far as education is concerned. If you don't believe me, these are some of the pictures that I took uh, from 1992 on, on the far left is what you see, but now in the year 2015 is what you see. The kind of, the, the kind of differences as far as global warming, climate change has caused us. If it is not too clear, I think it becomes very clear to us that we are the cause of this. In other words, the kind of education that we give to our students, the kind of education that we provide for them, do not even answer some of these issues that is happening around us uh, perhaps almost every day until, uh, until what you call uh, the next uh, century or so. Is global warming real? There is another set of pictures, 1928 and 2004, all the glaciers now have turned into a kind of a lake uh, on, on both sides, right? And it was said that built environment contribute to this to as much as 40%. So you guys who are working on this will have to take some responsibility and accountability if there is a kind of impact that we built and we give through our education for the students to come. I don't know what else is going to happen, but certainly we are worried about you know, uh, the rising the sea level and so on and so forth if this is not addressed correctly to education and the proper education at that. So we're in a, in a crisis state. We need to find out whether in the word Chinese crisis is made of danger and opportunity. I think we all know that, but who's providing the leadership? Who's decided whether it's danger or whether an opportunity given a place like this uh, what are we going to build on this? Are we going to build another very dangerous kind of uh, a structure? Or are we going to build something which is now quite different that gives another hope, another opportunity to move forward? I think that's a decision that professionals like you uh, need to decide where to go as far as it's concerned. And this is where I think the word resilience and sustainability come from. I think this word which is not strange uh, for us, but I think it is quite strange in the context of education. The word resilience, I think, is hardly heard. And sustainability, as I've mentioned, is also not a very common word in education in whatever sort they are talking about. Yeah. So I want to very quickly say resilience is talking about the capacity over time in facing disturbances. How do you deal with disturbances so that we don't lose the question of sustainability, which is the capacity to preserve the whole environment in the long run? And these two needs to interact with one another, be it your curriculum, be it the pedagogy, and be it the ecosystem uh, at the same time. I think this is what it should be. If you are resilient today, then you are, you are able to ensure what sustainability is all about uh, tomorrow and, in fact, for the future at the same time. Right? Let me just very quickly talk about resilience. I think you know resilience about springing back. So we talk about resilience and we will bounce back. In other words, whatever difficulty we face today in COVID, we're able to bounce back, we're able to make sure that sustainability stays at the end of the day. And this can only happen if there is a set of values that we looked into, right? So it, it, it becomes a kind of a value-laden, a, a value-based structure. Uh, it says here is a combination of character, uh, character traits, including courage, strength, will, tenacity, discipline, and faith. And this is where the values needs to come in, in the context of trying to preserve what resilience is all about. Yeah, It's an, our ability to recover quickly from disruptive chain or misfortune without over, being overwhelmed or acting in the dysfunctional or harmful way. I think the COVID, particularly uh, in the UK and the US, will tell us exactly what this is all about. What does it mean to the future of humankind as such? Yeah? It covers the different dimension. And I think some of the definition looks very good. 
when you talk about the physical and the mental dimension, it is about adaptability. It's about recovering. It's about the strength and endurance that we give to our students in making decisions given the knowledge base that they've got. Yeah? When it comes to social and spiritual dimension, which is a total sort of dimension that we are talking about, how do you manipulate the system so that it remains intact, not only physically, mentally, but also spiritually? I think that's the part that we want to champion. How does the spiritual value, the core values that we talk about, becomes a contact between humanity across the world, no matter who you are or wherever, wherever you are? So that resilience is about us and the natural world. It's about us and the environment around us. We are not able to separate it because we are on, we are on the same plane, spiritually speaking. All right? Nature's resilience, I think this is one of the quotes that I like. We talk about when life's strong winds come blowing, the bend with them and let go. And when you bend with them and let go, it means we are building some strength in places that the bend takes place. And if you do this often enough, you become stronger, right? But letting go, it means that we give different, different rooms for things to grow better. When the leaves goes, other leaves will grow and we'll make that better things at the, end, at, the end, at the end of the day. But what is more important, I think, the storm will make the roots go deeper and deeper. And this is the value that I talked about. Where is the value and where is the rooting when you talk about architecture, uh, built environment, or whatever is related? What sort of value are we trying to communicate with our students? What is the value that we can communicate with ourselves so that this value remains strong as we build yeah, uh, the curriculum, uh, pedagogy, or whatever? How does resilience and sustainability becomes an interacting force, as I've mentioned earlier in, in, in my slides. This is something, I think this is a miss, not only in architecture, in many other disciplines, because these are areas which is new in, in the context of trying to save the world, uh, as it were. Uh, one, one other slide I saw here, a nature's resilient a year, a year after wildfire, because the roots are strong, it begins to grow. That's why we talk about build back better. And because of the roots, because of the values, is there, it is the one that assures that the future will be sort of sufficiently maintained over a period of time. There's another picture which I like. You can see the roots and the tree grows because of that roots, the values that, 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 that we talked about. Yeah? I want to use this as a kind of a metaphor, the resilience. And I think from our point of view, from the Eastern dimension, bamboo is something that we value very much. And I'm sure as architects, you will understand it as well. Bam like bamboo, it bends, but it does not break, right? And bamboo also will tell us that the higher it is, the greater is the bend. In other words, when we have more knowledge that if we grow higher, the bend is even greater. In other words, become more humble. In other words, as architects, as people who are professional, we are not arrogant in dealing with the environment. We are always subservient to the environment because the environment gives the values of humility as far as, as, far as that's concerned. So we bend, but we do not break, right? We are deeply rooted, yet we are flexible. And the roots, I again uh, want to repeat, is a value. And the value will make us more flexible because we are convinced that the value will sustain as we move forward. Right? We talk about finding wisdom in emptiness. This is something that I think we will not, we have missed. Eh? We find wisdom sometimes, wisdom is not in education anymore. We talk about knowledge, we talk about the publication, we talk about so many things, but there's hardly wisdom in that because we are so busy in trying to articulate things which actually has no value in, the, in that particular context. Talk about ranking. I think we have seen the discussion on ranking uh, the last few weeks, I'm sure. Uh, sugar daddy ranking now, predatory ranking, all sorts of things make us busy and we have lots of wisdom as such. So we need to create this humility that I mentioned to you about where we talk about we are able to actually understand what the value of nature is all about and indeed learn from nature. There's a whole discipline called biomimicry now where architect takes inspiration from it, you know, from uh, Anne's house, uh, from all other things that's happening. We have got now so many things that we can learn from nature as an inspiration for architect. We don't have to, to devise something which is new, which is artificial, uh, that will not work against, uh, that will work against our uh, natural sort of uh, dimension, right? 
you will have a, a running stream. A running stream could be could be a settled uh, to be likened to a, an unsettled an unsettled mind. You cannot see your, your reflection in an, in a running stream. And what we need is actually sometimes the only is we can only do that in a still water. Then you begin to see what's underneath as far as the fish or the coral or whatever it is. And you need this stillness of mind. And I think these perhaps the other dimension that we have missed altogether in trying to create ideas, which is actually more compatible to us as a human person in a spiritual level, uh, as it were. Now, so build environment, let me just uh, conclude this by, by saying, look, uh, we need to have the kind of uh, uh, ecology that supports it. You cannot build an environment with destroying the ecology around it, right? Then ecology will then come compass all this. I think I'm sure you know this better, the housing, the transportation, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, we should be able to protect and reshape the future as we move along. So there is technology. Of course, technology is important. But which is a technology that will support the future and make the future actually sustainable in that particular context. Yeah? I am very mindful, uh, Prof, when we talk in Malaysia about 4IR. To all other countries that have been, they have not taken 4IR the way we have taken it. But I wonder whether this 4IR will be sustainable in the long run. Yeah? So we need to now understand the relationship between resilience and sustainability and how to optimize it. And we need to have the skill of being resilient so that sustainability will be the outcome uh, at the end of the day. Resilience, never give up, fall down seven times, get up eight, which is the problem of the Japanese. Japanese loves bamboo very much. This is one of the, this is one of the values that they describe. And let's go back to our own culture. Yeah? When we talk about normal, new normal, I tend to talk about the renewed normal. The old has been there for a long time. They have forgotten it because we think it is no longer important. Suddenly, we are told we cannot shake hands. But since when do we shake hands, at least from this tradition? Yeah? We have namaste, we have you know, ha uh, pani, uh, hand on the heart, we have all sorts of other things. Shaking hand is not about us in a sense. Look at the Japanese again. Yeah? They bow. Uh, at this level, if they're sorry, they bow a, a, a lot more uh, compared to just saying hi, all right? But there is no physical context in the context of Eastern tradition traditionally, right? Unlike this kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, practices. This was brought in through colonial uh, practices, and now suddenly we say we are not supposed to shake hands because contact is not good as far as COVID is concerned. My slides on this is basically, what is the relevance of local values and culture in architecture in built environment? Have we lost it altogether? When I talk about my room has no windows, my local values and culture, when I build a house, the old house, I say, there are windows all over. You know, where, do we have, where, where have we missed this? And now we need to go back to the renewed values rather than the, the new values as such as invented by somebody else at the end of the day. So when we talk about this in the context of COVID and environment, I want to share you this document, shared responsibility, global solidarity in trying to respond with COVID-19. And the opening statements by the Secretary General talk about this. Our roadmap is the 2030 agenda, the one that you talked about, which is similar and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And what does it say? It says this, yeah? Everything we do during and after this crisis, which is the COVID-19, must be with a very strong focus on building on equal, inclusive, sustainable economies and societies. Have we been building equal, inclusive, and sustainable economies and society to architecture that are more resilient in the face of pandemic, climate change, and many other global changes. We are going into many more pandemics as we move as we move into the future, unless and until we build this as part and the foundation of education moving forward, we will be losing to other pandemics, maybe assuming that we will win this one, right? So finally, I want to go into the definition of sustainable development. Sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. These are Greta Thunberg and Seven Suzuki, all right? 
But what is funny about this uh, uh, definition, we are now challenging it. He said, we are asking, what about the past? Why are we talking about just the present and the future? Why do we not go back into the past? The past is where the local heritage is, the value that we have somehow or other forgotten, and now we need to bring it back, right? And if you look at, look at sustainable development, the little research that we do, we go to Bali, for example, when you look at the Subak ecosystem, that was there 900 years ago, not just 30 years ago, because Brunton report talk about sustainable development. You go to Thailand, you see self-sufficient economy that was promoted by the former king has been there almost 100 years. We talk about uh, Bhutan yeah, and gross national happiness that was there in the 1600s, more, more than 200 years ago. In Malaysia, we also have got our own words, which is sejahtera. Sejahtera is equivalent to sustainable development, but we are not actually using it. And in fact, most of us do not even understand what sejahtera is all about in the context of building, in the context of architecture, if I may say so. So we need to remain relevant. How to remain relevant is to go back to where we were as a person. We are the first person actually to talk about what we know in the context of our own culture, dimension and values, and then put this together so that we can lead by example. And these examples are the one that will tell us whether we will be successful because before in the past we have made it happen but we have destroyed it somehow or other as we moved along now i think we need to reclaim it and make it happen yeah so again coming back to we are the one that is a cause for all these issues and education perhaps is part of the problem we need to fix this and we need to make this right right whether we like it or not i think we are moving into another era called the anthro anthropocene and the Anthropocene, by simple definition, is where human beings are beginning to destroy its own civilization. In the Holocene is where we build our own civilization the way we see it now. But the Anthropocene is where we're going to destroy our own civilization because we've got it wrong in the context of the values and the foundation of education, as it were. Right? So there you are. If you are able to build this resiliency, and show some sort of fortitude by example, maybe our students, maybe the people who will learn from us will be begin more convinced that we need to make the change and the change must start with us. I don't think the change will start with the curriculum or the pedagogy. The change must start with the human person. And if the human person do not make the change, then we will not be able to do it. I would like to conclude by saying to look at built environment, how do we set the right examples where the built environment is all about? In other words, how can we remain resilient as a kind of a value that we impart to our students through education, formal or otherwise? What sort of values are we going to root our education, right? At the end of the day, how do you build and stay sustainable? Yeah? And for that sustainability, we are beginning in our university building what we call a kind of a transitory idea of human minds and the human heart working together and we are building what we call the sejahtera leadership sejahtera leadership encompasses both resilience and sustainability together as part and parcel education post-covid inshallah so i'm sorry about the technical uh, uh, disturbances but I hope uh, you have made some contribution for the discussion that's coming on. So thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and a greeting of peace. Thank you, Tansi Datuk Zulkifli Adoraza, for value-loaded presentation. Uh, we love to see it more, but unfortunately, the time is not with us. Uh, we shall move uh, to the next presenter. I will meet you again, Tansi, during the question and answer session later on. I know that viewers are eager to ask questions, so please keep the question coming for the final section of this webinar. Respected viewers and participants, I shall now take you to the third panelist, Professor Dr. Chris Tweed, the head of Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff, United Kingdom. His brief re resume is projected on the screen that you can read from it. Uh, in the interest of time, I will highlight a few about Professor Chris. 
he has been appointed as a jury member for the President Medal of R RIBA Research. He is also currently serving as the Chair in Sustainable Design and Director of the BRE Trust Center for Sustainable Design of the Built Environment. Clearly, Professor Chris Tweed is a person who has wide experience in research and education in architecture and who has experience working at several universities in the UK and the US. Professor Chris Tweed will deliver a presentation entitled The Role of Research-Led Design in Architectural Education, Relevancy and Challenges in Facing a Crisis. How are you, Prof. Chris? I'm very well, thank you. Are you ready for this? I am very ready, yes. Okay, the line is yours. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Syed. Uh, well, good day, respected colleagues. Um, the sun is, has just risen in, in Cardiff in Wales. Um, it's looking to be a rather cold and, and wet day, so I hope you're having uh, nicer weather in, in wherever you are and whichever time zone you're in. I'm delighted uh, to be part of this webinar and um, to share a virtual platform with the uh, distinguished speakers that we've already heard from. I'm honored to be here and I'd like to thank um, Lam and, and the other organizers for inviting me. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for attending um, this panel. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the uh, earlier presentations. One of the uh, disadvantages of um, being the uh, the last speaker of, of the session means that uh, the other speakers have already said many of the things that, that I want to say, um, but I don't always uh, align completely with, with, with some of the views. So I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting discussion uh, afterwards. So let me begin by sharing some thoughts uh, about what I see as a, a crisis of relevance uh, facing the architectural profession. Next slide, please. Um, I can slide. actually see my slides. Ah. It should be coming soon, uh, Prof. Please, you continue talking. Continue okay. Presenting. All right. Well, um, the slide will uh, simply flag that there is a, a crisis of, crisis of relevance. I think within within architecture certainly within the UK. Um, I'm ashamed to say I don't know so much about the profession in Malaysia, but uh, I think many of the problems that we face in the UK are, are we can find in, in other countries in the world. Um, and one, one of the points that I want to make is that uh, the recent global prices, uh, crises that we're, that we're facing uh, have exposed some weaknesses in architecture as uh, Professor Razak uh, has recently said, yeah, if you could move on for that one, please. Yeah, okay, leave it there for now. Um, you know, we are, we are um, the, the crises of, of clim the climate emergency and so on has exposed weaknesses in architecture and the built environment. We're not terribly well equipped to deal with many of the problems that face uh, society and humanity today. Um, and the professions are often quite slow to respond to these important challenges. So rather than leading, they often appear to be, um, as we say, on the back foot. They're reacting instead of being proactive. I should caveat my remarks by saying that I don't imagine the profession is likely to disappear anytime soon. So these are not existential threats, but there are clear signs that I see that the influence of the architectural profession is diminishing rather than growing. And I do find that concerning. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So for many of us who were educated in the UK, <clears throat> this has been the historical starting point for our studies. But of course, our knowledge of history of architecture has been supplemented um, with lectures on building physics, structures, construction, 
design methods, materials, and now sadly missing from when I studied psychology. The architectural curriculum is packed and it seems that architects need to take on more and more knowledge as the diversity and complexity of buildings increases and the expectations on their performance rise ever higher. I've lost the slides again. The methods for producing modern buildings are very different to what was used in ancient Greece. If you can show the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. We have slight pro problem, Chris, with the slides. We are working on it. Do you want me to share my screen? Huh? Okay. Can you do that, please, or please? Yeah. Okay, how do I actually do that? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. You will send participant, please bear with us for a few seconds or while we're sorting out the technical features. Yeah, it's not it's not allowing me to share the screen. Sorry. It's okay. Are you able to fix it there? Yeah, we're working on we're working on it. Okay, I'll carry on talking. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so the next slide, I'll describe it to you. <laughs> the next <laughs> slide. The next slide uh, was a very different, uh, very strong contrast to the Parthenon. It's a slide showing uh, Frank Gehry's Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. Uh, which marks uh, a really important inflection point in the history of architecture uh, in many ways. Um, one being, of course, that it, it was um, would be have been impossible to design without the aid of computer software. In this case, um, the CATIA software developed outside mainstream architecture for the aerospace industry in France. The concert hall was intended to establish Los Angeles as a cultural center to rival cities like New York, London, Paris, and Berlin. It drew comparisons with the Sydney Opera House as one of the early iconic buildings that tried to establish a signature for cities in the age of rapid global communications. Now, don't get me wrong, shiny objects have their place, but they are never going to provide the substance of a serious profession that can lay claim to enhancing the lives of people everywhere. And there were some uh, negative reactions to Gary's concert hall. Uh, Alice Callahan of uh, Las Familias del Pueblo, a local community group said, it's fine to have a music center, but this has cost $276 million. And if you add the $200 million that the cathedral cost, that's almost half a billion dollars to provide services for the rich. Where's the half billion for the poor? Also, a story circulating at the time was that Gary was asked to hand over control of the detailed design construction to a more conventional and pragmatic architectural practice, but he refused. A frequent lament of many architects is that the discipline has ceded ground to others, effectively painting itself into a corner 
while surveyors, engineers, planners, and other built environment professionals occupy ter territory that we used to hold. Partly this is because modern buildings are so complicated that it's almost impossible for a single professional to cover all of the knowledge needed to be able to design and construct them. And clients now, they now expect much more from their buildings. Many buildings must support complex and sophisticated activities with greater expectations uh, placed on their performance. And when architects aren't able to deliver that performance, others step in. I was reminded of this recently <clears throat> when I served on the judging panel for one of my university's new flagship buildings, a center for student life in Cardiff. And I was surprised to find that in some of the submissions, there were documents prepared by what are now known as service designers. Now these weren't specialist designers of heating, ventilating and cooling installations. They are specialists who consider the client services the building is intended to offer and their various needs. I was disappointed to learn that such considerations were no longer included in the architectural services that a practice might be expected to offer. I can't think of a more fundamental design activity than trying to understand the needs of the building users and how those might vary depending on the purposes of those users. And I ask myself, why are architects not doing this? Of course, I take on board the point made by Professor Salama earlier that uh, it's not just um, <clears throat> it's not just about architects. We have to uh, we have to look at what others uh, are, are bringing to the table in uh, in the built environment. But the curriculum has uh, has got very crowded, um, and designing the curriculum is always difficult. Psychology, which I mentioned earlier, was probably shunted out of the architectural curriculum in the UK um, by the need to learn how to work with um, with computer-aided design software. And the curriculum is so packed that something has to give. However, some people within the construction industry recognize that there is a need for change. Can you Can you move on to the next slide, please? Uh, next one. Yeah, that's it. No, back, back one, please. So, um, <clears throat> nearly six years ago now, uh, Paul Morell published his report on collaboration for change, which was an investigation into the uh, built environment professions, including architecture. It highlighted gaps in the education of architects but also other built environment professionals. And it said that those needed to be addressed within 10 years if the professions were not to become irrelevant. Now, the Morel report, its primary focus is on ethical behavior. Unlike the previous uh, two reports, the Egan and the Latham reports, which were more concerned with the efficiency of the construction industry. And I think that the Morel report goes straight to the heart of what it means to be a professional and the duty of care one needs to provide, not just for clients, but for society and humanity. Next slide, please. So I'm, there are many recommendations that have come from uh, Morel. I'm not gonna uh, repeat all of those, but uh, one, they're, they're divided up into different categories. And one of the categories is ethics, ethics and the public interest. And one of the recommendations is to develop and standardize a national code of conduct stroke ethics across the built environment professions, building on sh shared experience in the UK and internationally. This is an important shift. And if you dig into the, uh, the detail of the report, and I would strongly encourage you to do that, you'll find that um, some of the statements say it isn't enough simply to be to adhere to the professional codes, it needs to go beyond that. Uh, and I think that's what's particularly interesting. So a question I have, next slide, please. 
a question I have asked myself in different forms. Uh, next slide. Is what can architecture do? What's architecture actually for? So some of the things that architecture can do, um, we know about, is it can care about the world and its living organisms. In much the same way that farmers are often cast as custodians of the natural environment, why aren't architects seen as being custodians of the designed world, the designed built environment? The second thing that I think is important that we do, and we know this anyway, is that architects solve wicked problems through design using, first of all, imagination and creativity, but also knowledge generated through research. And that's what I want to really focus on uh, in this talk today. But the final point on that slide is that architects make it real through practice. They make a difference. It's not some theoretical uh, exercise. They actually make things real. Next slide, please. So my starting point is caring. And I think um, Professor Razak encapsulated this when he talked about individuals. And I think the first requirement for a good architect is that he or she must care. They must care about the work that they're doing. They must care about the world. They must care about the environment that they're operating in. And that caring must be enshrined in their personal values. I have noticed a change in attitude among students within my own institution. They come to us now and they want to make a positive difference to the world. Globalization has allowed them to see more of the world and they have been exposed to different cultures, beliefs and values. They find it difficult to reconcile the differences between the life they enjoy with those of people who appear to be less fortunate in distant lands and they visit these sites. Next slide, please. And they want to help, but they are not equipped with the contextual knowledge and the understanding to be able to act effectively. And just as importantly, to know when not to act. So whilst I ap applaud their motivation and their values, um, we have to be careful about how we intervene, how we interfere in, in other contexts. Within the West School of Architecture, we've seen some very highly successful not-for-profit ventures. Um, and, but recently in, in the press, there has been a backlash against this kind of work where it has earned the pejorative label of volunteerism. It is argued that in many cases, these projects do more harm than good. The criticisms that are made include high carbon emissions, the cost of transporting students across the world and so forth. So caring within architecture by future architects is here to stay, but it needs to be refined and thought about more carefully with greater nuance. We're not lacking in motivation, but we don't yet understand how to be effective and how to become more relevant. In the early part of the pandemic in the UK, the contribution of healthcare and so, uh, social care professionals was recognised as being vital to the well-being of the entire population. And I have to confess to some professional envy. Doctors, nurses, carers and so on were all quite rightly lauded, but it made me think about what architects might do. And of course, some schools within the UK I explored the possibilities of making personal protective equipment using their 3D printers and so on. But I was left with questions about what architects might do on a larger scale and in the future. Next slide, please. Medics have their Hippocratic Oath, and I'm not going to go through um, all of the excerpts that I provided here. But I do wonder if there is something that we could develop that would have a similar commitment in architecture. Why don't we have that already? I'm, 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 I'm puzzled by that. So I'll leave that with you maybe as something to, to, to ponder. So I've suggested that caring is an important characteristic for architects 
but without proper channeling and guidance, it risks doing more harm than good. For it to succeed, it needs to be founded on the best knowledge. Next slide, please. And I wonder if there's a body of knowledge in architecture. Well, there is, but unlike other disciplines, it doesn't really have its own methods. It doesn't uh, have the foundations that you find in, for example, the natural sciences. Next slide, please. James Snyder, um, uh, I hope you can read that, uh, presented a spectrum of knowledge in architecture. Uh, running from simple observation on the left-hand side through to the physical sciences on the right-hand side. And that's pretty much describes what, what uh, the kind of methods that we have adopted within, within architecture. Next slide, please. One unique area of knowledge that we should have and should be using is our knowledge of how people use buildings. What I was shocked to discover that only 3% of architects in the UK, UK carry out post-occupancy evaluations or POEs. So there's a severe lack of knowledge harvesting. Next slide, please. I'm very honored and humbled to be part of the UK's Research Excellence Framework, uh, which uh, assesses the research carried out by um, all universities within, within the UK and it's divided up into different sub panels. And I'm serving on the architecture, built environment and, and planning uh, sub panel. Next slide, please. It covers a wide range of activity, um, but there are three main criteria that it uses for assessing quality. They are originality, significance and rigor. Next slide, please. So that's a rather long definition of what uh, originality uh, is considered to be within research and architecture. And that the one phrase I want to highlight is that it looks for innovative contributions to understanding and knowledge in the field. Next slide, please. Significance, the second criterion. Next slide, please. A much shorter uh, definition um, but it is taken to be the extent to which the work has influenced or has the capacity to influence knowledge and scholarly thought or the development and understanding of policy and or practice. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. This final category of rigor, I think, is, is hugely important. Uh, and with apologies to uh, Prof Salama, I think there's still some mileage in the enlightenment goals of uh, attending to uh, evidence on the rigorous methods that are used to challenge evidence and to ensure that it is the best possible knowledge that we can get. Now, if you mention the REF to people, to academics in the UK, they will probably groan. But I think there is there is value in it. And the fact that it's been adopted by other countries uh, notably Hong Kong, I think is an important uh, reminder for us. Next slide, please. Let me turn to architectural education then. Um, within the Russell group of universities, which is considered to be the elite group, I'm not quite sure why that is, but um, they tend to be the older universities. They focus on uh, being research led. Next slide, please. Again, sorry, you probably won't be able to read this, um, but basically this is um, our attempt within the Welsh School of Architecture to align our research, our knowledge generation with our teaching programs. So along the bottom, there are our various research groups. And then rising up from that, we have the various teaching programs and the dots that are in each of the programs suggest where we insert the knowledge that we have generated through research. Next slide, please. So more generically, I think this is the model I would recommend uh, for structuring a, a curriculum. Along the bottom, and this again ties in with Professor Razak's uh, presentation, we have values, the caring values. In this case, the values of sustainability, not just environmental, but social and economic. Those push the development of research. 
they push the development of teaching and education programs. Along the top, we have the challenges that are faced by society and humanity, and they pull the knowledge that we generate through research and deliver to our students through education. Next slide, please. This harks back to an older uh, view of how architecture should be uh, carried out. Uh, the Fountainhead, of course, the famous novel and a film starring Gary Cooper as the architect. Um, the novel and the film embodies what Ayn Rand, the author, believed to be the ideal man, and his struggle reflects Rand's belief that individualism is superior to collectivism. That was the role model enshrined in architectural education for many, many years. And unfortunately, it's still evident in some places. However, I think now there is a, there is a greater recognition of the need to work together rather than strike out as lone individuals, pitting ourselves against the pressure to work as a team. Next slide, please. So what I'm suggesting is that we should be value driven rather than ego driven. This is what we are trying to do within the Welsh School. We are striving to identify the core values that should underpin architectural education for the future. Next slide, please. There are lessons to be learned from big science. I'm fortunate to be in a, uh, a college of physical sciences and engineering, and I have learned a lot from my colleagues in the natural sciences. Next slide, please. One of the things I've been asked to do is take part in selection panels for staff in other schools. And I was amazed to discover how they, um, how they published. This is the, just the title uh, on the author list from a paper in physics. And you can see it's a very long author list. And the order is not necessarily important. And in fact, some physics papers, they have 100 authors and they're all listed alphabetically. So the egos are put to one side and the work takes priority. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things I was asked to do as part of my talk was to talk about infrastructure, in particular studio infrastructure, and whether we should name, uh, rename studios as labs rather than studios. So I've offered some possibilities for developing the future curriculum driven by values and drawn by societal needs. And I've also drawn comparisons with our colleagues in the natural sciences where labs are part of uh, routine business. However, one of the, the strangest things that's happened in my college since I've been uh, part of that is that the physical sciences are looking to architecture or educational methods and their labs and their teaching has become much more studio oriented than it ever was before and they they are stealing ideas they are stealing educational models from us so i wouldn't give up on the studio yet i think there's still a lot that goes on within studio that we want to hang on to but what i would say is that we should uh, we could, should continue to uh, conduct research that generates the kind of knowledge that has the originality, significance and rigor that we need to make uh, good knowledge claims and to practice effectively. Now, you'll notice I haven't really said much about the crises that we're facing at the moment. Uh, others have already mentioned the pandemic and how we're responding to that. One of the things that I'm uh, probably most disappointed in is that I've yet to see architects step up and tell us about the future. Others have said that there won't, we won't be going back to normal, but we should be designing what we will be going back to and making the most of our skills uh, as imaginers and, and as uh, creators to, to develop new models. The climate emergency, is obviously one of the biggest challenges we're facing. And in the, um, I noticed in the, in the newspapers this morning, Bill Gates um, was saying that the climate emergency 
uh, will vastly uh, overwhelm us. Uh, it'll be much, much harder to solve than the pandemic. Now, the, the profession within the UK, the RBA, has finally um, recognised the responsibility that architects need uh, to carry to address uh, the issues of sustainability. And they're now built into a new set of criteria which are uh, currently being rolled out and which um, schools will have to demonstrate compliance with. We're lucky in the Welsh School of Architecture in that we've had a, a long tradition of architectural science, um, looking at energy in buildings, looking at climate uh, and looking at environment. And I was reminded of this rather sadly last week when I learned that um, one of our former professors, Pat O'Sullivan, uh, passed away last week. Pat was the first um, chair in architectural science within the UK. And he, along with Barry Wilson in Edinburgh, really pioneered the development of uh, introducing scientific knowledge into schools of architecture in the UK. He was an immense force in, in shaping the discipline. And that discipline continues in many of the, the uh, schools of architecture that we have in the UK. Not all, but many. So I want to finish now uh, really just by wrapping up and mentioning one further crisis that we're facing. And this is a crisis of knowledge. We've heard a lot of talk about fake news. We've heard a lot of talk about various conspiracies. And we've all seen how susceptible we can be to misinformation and to claims that rest on flimsy evidence or none at all. And even our own politicians within the UK have been heard to say that we've heard enough from experts. Well, I don't think we have. And I, I understand where that view is coming from, but I believe it is incredibly dangerous. And as architects, we should regard ourselves and we should shape ourselves as architects, uh, as experts. Um, we've also heard during the pandemic, pol politicians saying they are being led by the science, they are following the science. Well, that is to, I think, is to uh, miscast science. Science is not one agreed set of knowledge. It is a process, and it is a process that is committed to free, honest, and open inquiry. Um, and that is the way that we make progress. But that progress only happens, of course, if we have the personal values that are committed to following that. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Chris Tweet, for that uh, very interesting and thoughtful presentation. Uh, sorry for the slight glitches, uh, but we are great that we are back. Uh, to overcome the glitches. Uh, okay. With presentation, uh, we finally arrived at the final section of this webinar, that is the Q&A session. I kindly invite members of the panel to be back in position for the session. I will read to you the questions and name the panel who should respond to it. With time permitting, I will invite other panels to respond to the same issue being discussed. At the same time, question may also be may also be projected on the screen as I speak, and you may read it there as well. We want to hear as much as possible from the panelists, so I will try my best to refrain participants from giving lengthy opinion. What we so eager to get from you is instructive. So let's begin with the Q&A session. The uh, sound, strange sound coming from somewhere. <laughs> okay, uh, let's begin with these questions. This is general questions. I will... Okay. The mechanistic model so embedded in our current pedagogy from lower school, primary school, I believe, 
right up to PhD and beyond does not encourage big picture mentality re required in current challenging times. How do we get away from these traits if we can only do it in architecture, architectural education? How do we remove this shackle? Any one of you would like to take it? Okay, Prof. Chris, please. Uh, well, it's nice to hear from Zaki. I hope you're well. Um, <laughs> I. I, I, I wanted to comment on this because uh, I totally agree with the question, if, that, if that's possible. Uh, in that, in a previous school, we used to run a um, second year project where our students would go out into primary schools and they would teach the primary school subjects through architecture. And then the, the pupils and our students would uh, get together at the end of the semester and present their work. And what was clear was that the primary school children, their imaginations were much, much more developed than our students. And that was a real eye-opener. Now, when confronted with that, what I believe, what I believe happened in that particular context was that the uh, imagination and creativity was stifled at secondary school level. Um, because that is when students were expected to, well, for want of a better word, to perform, to uh, to pass examinations, and I think that was the beginning of 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 how things were changed for them. I would like to think that in a school of architecture, there would be an opening up of that, and certainly I see that with students coming in from secondary school, they are a little bit lost for a while because. They've previously been so heavily constrained within uh, within secondary school that they don't know how to handle open-ended and creative projects. So my only suggestion is that we continue to develop um, and allow our students to develop uh, a much more open-minded, a much more open-ended um, way of approaching problems, but grounded in the rigor that I think is needed at the very end. Thank you, Prof. Yes, Prof. Zul, I saw your hands. Please proceed, Prof. Okay, I would like to echo what uh, Prof. Tweet has said. I think basically in Malaysia, uh, our education system is very rigid. Um, mechanical, mechanistic is one of the way to describe it. In other words, very exam oriented, very rote learning kind of a thing. And we are more interested in the right answers rather than the right questions. And I think this whole thing needs to change. And the way to change it uh, is basically uh, to get rid of the exams per se. I think we need to stretch out learning uh, as something which is happening uh, all, all the time. And in the university, in our university, you now we begin to break into what we call community engagement. In other words, whatever it is learned in classroom must be translated into a kind of a project that involves the community. Learn to apply, and not only learn to apply, but also learn to co-create with the community because they themselves have got a body of knowledge that we have totally forgotten, particularly when we work with the indigenous population, which is very close by that they've got different sort of knowledge in trying to understand what the environment is all about, architecture is all about, even the whole lifestyle which is new. So we need to start moving away from this rigidity. And this is where I think universities need to play a role, uh, to experiment and to start what you call, I like, I like the whole idea of a studio, which is almost a living lab. You know, that's where you experiment uh, whatever knowledge it is. The science lab is not as good as studio. I think studio would be a better word where you can actually uh, implement or experiment. So our kulia of uh, architecture and environmental design is developing what you call a living lab just across the kulia or the faculty so that we can actually get into the practice of translating knowledge into into a reality at a very at a very young stage, a year one and so on and so forth. Thank you. First and three are talking about studio as living lab. We we 
earlier in Professor Ashraf Salama in his presentation talking about global views and the regional context. Uh, how best is architecture studio teaching in, for design studio in various parts of the world? Uh, meaning that it cannot be the same teaching design studio in, in the UK and in, in places like in Africa and South Asia. So what do you got to offer Prof, Prof Salama uh, as regards to teaching design studio in the current context? I would say, okay, uh, again, the idea of the studio is a very important thing, and it's a tradition that characterizes architecture education for hundreds of years. Now, if I'm teaching a um, design studio in a place in a rural area in South Africa or in Nigeria, the question would be, would we teach architecture using the same model of the design studio that we have in any capital major city or in, in the West? That's the question. My view is we brought, we transposed the entire idea of the studio into other contexts without looking at the particularities of these contexts and what they can offer. So the question is, in, in my view, we really need to look at the qualities uh, of the context and how that shaped indigenous knowledge. And then we develop a studio suitable to Nigeria or suitable to South Africa or whatever context. So I think it's, 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 it's not an easy one, really, because the norm is we start, we start history books always from volume one. We never look in volume zero. And volume zero is about the vernacular. It's about the pre-recorded history. And we need to look at that. And it applies to Design Studio too. So. Like to add to that? Yes, I mean, I, I agree. I think I think local knowledge uh, is a very important aspect of this. And uh, just just to uh, mention that we're currently rebuilding our building, we're refurbishing it, and we have created um, a space within it, which we have called the living lab. And the purpose of that living lab is to engage with people from outside the school. Uh, it's to bring in people because we we I mean we work very closely with communities uh, in Cardiff and South Wales, uh, and uh, so it's really important that we, I mean, co-design and and co co-creation of research are very um, very important topics at the moment, and I think that's that's the way that architecture is changing. It's it's becoming uh, we're becoming more humble. And I think the pandemic has made us all uh, a, a lot more humble and, and climate change will, will further increase our humility. And I think that's a really good direction to be moving in. But at the same time, we mustn't absolve our responsibilities as uh, experts. So it's not a matter of handing over the design to communities and saying, here, you get on with it. We do have expert knowledge and we need to bring that to bear. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is for Tansri. Uh, what is your opinion on the act of greenwashing, which is about misleading consumers regarding the environmental practices in order to benefit company products or services? I, I, you know what my response is. I think basically education is about, quote unquote, looking for the truth. In other words, we try to expro approximate as much as possible what is best for community. And education is, at, at the end of the day, is about leveling the society. And if you have this kind of uh, uh, false information or crafting information for a vested interest, I think we in the university must be responsible uh, in trying to put that right. And I think that's it is one of my other disappointments as far as the intellectual community uh, in Malaysia is concerned. We are rather quiet on this. 
uh, we do not want to speak out we do not want to uh, quote unquote jeopardize uh, our 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 career as it were and we prefer to remain quiet and therefore at the end of the day the community suffers the community do not learn as much as we could as they could so for example if you talk about consumerism uh, now when i ask the students uh, what has changed in terms of uh, the covid environment uh, the answer that i get now we do our our shopping online you know they do they still do shopping they still do and 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 and, and you know and spend the way they they, they did uh, pre covid the only dif the only difference now is they do it online so we are talking about just the delivery is different but the substance is the same and i worry this is what's happening now when we talk about uh, what you call uh, education from home uh, we try to fit in as much as possible uh, we are not gaining anything because the environment is not suited for this and we keep on hearing at least in malaysia talk about online online learning which i have no problem with but are we prepared for this so these are issues where tech companies comes in you know people with uh, technology selling you all sorts of things what do we do what about remote learning as such what about uh, learning that use other mechanism uh, like tvs or things like that for the remote area so i think the, the community in in that in this particular respect needs to be more critical of, of policies uh, that is made uh, for us to uh, criticize as far as uh, and the environment is concerned and, and we have seen this in my university when we got locked down for a month we find all the animals are coming back the wild boars are coming back, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the birds are coming back, you know, all sorts of animals that was there before, now suddenly coming back. What does it mean? It means the moment we learn how to behave properly, we are beginning to share our environment with other uh, lives at the same time. And that, I think, is what education needs to, to be uh, post-COVID, inshallah. Okay, thank you, Tan Sri. Uh, the next question will be for Professor Chris Tweed. Uh, five years of program might not be able to cover all knowledge area. Can we say that the future of architectural education will be more of a regional or global collaboration and to be more symbiotic? This question is from Chia Lin Lin. Yeah, I, five years isn't enough. A, li a lifetime might, might just cover it. But uh, I think um, I think Ashraf mentioned this in his, his presentation that, you know, we, we need to start working in silos and, and architects. Um, we're, we're kind of specialists in generalism. And, uh, you know, we, we one of the things that we do within an architectural education is we acquire enough knowledge to be able to talk to other experts. And buildings are so complicated nowadays that 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 architects can't do it alone. Uh, and they haven't been able to do that for many years. So I think the best that we can do is we can we can enter into dialogue with the other professions um, and offer that uh, holistic view which is a key to sustainability uh, that maybe isn't encouraged within uh, the more specialized uh, areas of the built environment, like engineering um, and planning, and even, even to some extent, urban design. So I think five years will have to be enough, um, at least to get us started uh, and to be able to talk uh, effectively with, with, with other members of the team. Um, I take another one question. This is for anybody interested. <laughs> Any one of you. Okay. We teach, we teach the students on the glory of being an architect. <laughs> but at some point, public perceived architects are merely people who draw plans and carry out building submission. How do we educate the public? From Ashraf. 
Okay, uh, it's just a viewpoint. Uh, it, the problem is not in the public. The problem is in the profession. The profession did not manage to communicate to the public the value of the architect. So you don't see that with medical doctors. Medical doc has has anybody heard that you go to a medical doctor and you bargain with the uh, on the fees with the medical doctor or with the lawyer? Never. Why? Because the value of the doctor and the lawyer is very well known and very well established to the client. The value of the architect is not established. Why? Because at the end, we never declare the knowledge system. And, and, uh, and I refer here to, uh, to uh, Professor Chris Street. The idea of, for example, post-occupancy evaluation, which is so critical and it's a good business for architects, even if I forget that it's an ethical approach to architecture. It is a good business. When you go to a restaurant, at the end of the experience in the restaurant, they give you a card to rate the ambience, the quality of food, and the quality of service, and all of this. Restaurants make business out of assessing themselves. And architecture should be able to make good business out of assessing themselves and architects. So I would say the problem is in the profession and the professional organizations, I must say, uh, not being able to communicate to the public what architects do. OK. Uh, I, I think I, I received an indication that uh, Prof. would like to ask a question. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I, I, I thought I would want to ask a question from my architect uh, friends. Okay, we are now in a situation where the buildings that I am in, uh, I'm, 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 I'm also asking my friends about this, uh, it is no longer fit for uh, the COVID environment. I was telling you, I want to reclaim all the windows. There's no windows now. I just need to survive on this air conditioning. I want to stop the air conditioning. I want fresh airs to come in. Uh, can this be part of a, a kind of a built environment education that you now kind of, you know, turn around a building to make it more inhabitable uh, for the post-COVID environment? Or do you leave this building as it is now that put us at the risk of having another kind of a pandemic? Uh, we are just talking about new buildings. What about the old buildings? What is your responsibility to the old buildings to make it more habitable uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned? Is that a consideration in, in, in built environment education? Um, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of words and then leave it to Professor Chris. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. There is no doubt that there will be a move from uh, designing buildings from scratch to retrofitting, remodeling, readaptation. If we look at the housing stock that exists now, all of this will require uh, uh, retrofitting and redevelopment. Um, if we look at uh, Swiss schools of architecture and the nature of the projects that they take, all of the projects are basically uh, remodeling, uh, retrofitting. Why? Because they don't want to build in the mountains in Switzerland. And the land is already built, so that's done. Most of the projects in, in uh, APFL in, in, in Lausanne and Zurich are about this. So I think <clears throat> the future to prepare for COVID and COVID-related things will go into remodeling and retrofitting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question will be the last question. Um, this is, in particular, I think the best person, because it has been mentioned earlier by Prof. Aisha, you probably want to respond to this. UIA awards school driven by effective teamwork. What about school culturally embedded with individualistic achievements to achieve such awards? Or to lessen effects of such mentality? Prof. Aisha. Yes, it's okay. I'm, I'm just going to say a couple of words here. I, I don't think uh, any education model that speaks to an individual maker, uh, and we've seen uh, Professor Tweed 
showed us uh, the uh, the fountainhead and the image of the architect as one person who's the creative, the productive, and that's it. I think is not going to go uh, well with the profession if we maintain that view. Um, it, now, if we look at the market, nobody wants the architect. In, in the past, they used to say the architect is the leader of the architectural work, right? Now, clients start by going to a project manager and the project manager hire the architect. <laughs> when we look at the project delivery models, it, the architect comes at the very end in the process, not in the beginning as it was in the past. Why? Because it's seen as a luxury. So that individual architect is seen as a luxury. It's not seen as an effective person working for uh, 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 the benefit of a client or society or community. I know it's a bit provocative, but... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any view on that, Prof. Chris? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I tried to get that across in my presentation that we need to leave behind that, that the fountainhead model. And I think we are we are, 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 are getting there. Um, but uh, just to come back to uh, the question that um, Professor Razak uh, uh, posed to us, here's, here's a further provocative uh, a thought experiment, if you like. What if somebody in Malaysia were to say yesterday, uh, Okay, we're done. Malaysia is built. That's it. No more new buildings. What would what would happen? I mean, technically, it would be possible to continue, but I don't think many architects would be very happy about <laughs> about not <laughs> not developing new buildings. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, honourable speakers. You have been great. You have been good very contributive. Um, stay with us for a while. Uh, we are approaching to the end of the session. Uh, I have one announcement to make. Uh, HPSN 2030 is launching a question and survey starting today to various groups of respondents as one of the means to capture data. There are four categories of questionnaire, namely alumni, academicians, students, and practitioners. Your participation in this survey is very important and most appreciated. Thank you. Time has indeed passed us at the speed of light. We have been on air for almost three hours. We have been on air for almost two and a half hours. Those who have registered his or her attendance will receive an e-certificate of attendance via email. To officiate the end of the second HPSN 2030 webinar, I am grateful for and welcome the presence of architect Zairul Azidin bin Badri, president of the Board of Architect Malaysia, to deliver his closing speech. Over to you, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Professor Dr. Syed Iskandar. Uh, salam sejahtera. Assalamualaikum. And a very good afternoon to all, especially in Malaysia. And I think it's still morning in UK. So to all board of members of Lembaga Architect Malaysia, Chairman, Council members of CAAEM or MAPS, distinguished speakers and respected participants of today's webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we have come to the end of the webinar session today, and it has been <clears throat> a, a truly great session. I have humbly received the many compliments of you, the speakers, and the many forum participants. Thank you again to all the expert panelists today, Professor Dr. Ashraf M. Salama, Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Dato Zulkifli Abdul Raza, and Professor Chris Tweet. Uh, let me start off with uh, sharing some of the quotes and statements by the leaders in the architectural education that the education of the future architects and the professional development of those who have already achieved professional status need to, need to focus on the core knowledge, skills and experience required to respond 
to the immediate challenges facing our world, society, and industry. We need to emphasize the attainment and the maintenance of competencies and the professional behavior that create public confidence in the capabilities of the professional architects to deliver buildings and spaces that perform to the standards and higher that client, uh, build users, and society rely upon. We must step further, showing leadership, accepting responsibility, and demonstrating competence when we ask to deal with risk and liability in the proof of our expertise. There is a need of new emphasis on the areas of expertise and the experience that impact on the quality of performance of the built environment and the health and the well-being of those who have used buildings and spaces, as well as our wider duties to society and the natural environment. Change in architectural education is being demanded by those stakeholders who will succeed the current generation of practice and institutional leadership, including students, graduates, and emerging professionals, for many of whom the current business model of architectural practice sometimes seems to pay insufficient attention to the critical question of designing first for health, safety, and well-being, embracing creative environmental stewardship, and placing a great emphasis on the ethical role of the architect. So in many of the points of deliberation today, focus area are to identify the challenges and the issues of implementation of current architectural education and in the future projection. I'm sure we have managed to capture the many points, the many important points and the direction as a good guide to formulate the new HPSN 2030. Before I end, I wish to extend our thanks to our organizing team, especially HPSN UTM team, COHAS, Ministry of Higher Education, all our speakers, especially all distinguished professors, our moderator, without whom this forum would not be possible, and especially to you, the attendees, respected participant. This is our forum. This is your forum, your home ground of exploration, and you will make this a lively interactive as you did. With that, I thank you all for your enthusiasm and presence today, which truly show your support and commitment to making today a successful event. I have now, if, if this has been allowed, declared the webinar session closed. Thank you. Wabilau Tafi wa Hidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala. Over to you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We have a little bit more to, to do before we end. Uh, can I have the slides on the conference? This is IAEEC, the ones that being announced by the chairmen of MAPS Malaysia, international, the first international architecture education exhibition and conference to be held in, on 26 to 27 October this year. Guess what? If COVID is still around, IAEEC will still proceed. So we will go virtual. So this is going to be a live, a big event, um, merging many school of architecture in the region, in Malaysia as well as in ASEAN, and we hope to also draw the interest from School of Architecture in the UK and Australia. We can share, we can uh, compete, we can share, and we can learn from each other from this conference and exhibitions. We look forward to meet you all on the 26th and 27th October. And uh, we would like uh, to record our deepest appreciation and gratefulness to our three panel members of their willingness to contribute to this webinar. As a symbol of appreciation, we ask panel members and chairman of MAPS, as well as president of LAM to join me in the screen and get yourself 
ready for a screenshot. Yes, okay. Another person. Okay, gentlemen, are you ready for a snapshot, screenshot? Smile and say cheese. One, two. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very again? much. Once again, please. One, two, and three. Thank you all, Flores. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, we are grateful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, God Almighty, for the time and opportunity He has bestowed on us that make this webinar possible. I would like to also record our sincere thanks to Ministry of Higher Education, especially to Associate Professor Dr. Wan Zuhainis bin Tisaad, Board of Architect Malaysia, especially its President Architect Zairul Azilin bin Badri, Majlis Akritasi Pendidikan Sri Bena, Council of Architectural Accreditation and Education Malaysia, Malaysia in particular, is Chairman Architect Mustafa Abin Rahman Saleh and Kohas Council of Head of Architecture School. In particular, is Chairman Assistant Professor Architect Dr. Sazali Bin Arifin, University Technology, University, University of Technology Malaysia, and the Head of HPSN Research Team, Associate Professor Dr. Eris Sabrina Bin Ismail, and the rest of the crew member, which you cannot see them. <laughs> A proud this uh, year in the second generation of the host of this event. We help you keep your distance, wash your hands, and keep wearing your mask. Wassalam, I am Syed Iskandar Arifin signing off for HPSN 2030. Thank you. Bye. Bye.